My name is Barbara, and I have a gambling addiction. I've come from a family of gamblers. We gambled all our lives. Um, when I was under 10, my parents would take me to the horse races, and we would go to the horse race and track, and at that time, kids couldn't get in, and we'd stand behind the fence. Uh, gambled was all our vacations were about gambling, and whether it was going to Lake George to go to Saratoga or to Las Vegas to play, you know, in the casinos. Never thought I had a problem, never would consider that I had a problem. My name is Bill D. I'm from Milford, Connecticut. Gambling was okay at first. It was more of a social thing. In the last five years, gambling became a real problem. It started off with going to the casinos maybe once a week. Then it got going to the casinos three, four times per week. Dollar-wise, it started out with going up with two or three hundred dollars. Then my bank increased to five hundred dollars, then a thousand dollars. And the thought was the more money you had, the more you could win, the longer you could stay and play. My name is Pam. My uncle was a bookie. And I remember being all of 10 years old running bets for my uncle. I'd come home from work and my father would say, let's go to the casino. And it became something that I looked forward to, something I did repeatedly. The worst thing that can happen to you is when you're gambling and someone walks up to you and says, oh, we love the way you're gambling. How would you like a free night? How would you like a concert ticket? Why don't we buy you dinner? Well, that's the kiss of death. <laughs> I know that now. Um, free? No. <laughs> you paid for it 20 times over. We have these messages about how normal gambling is and how fun it is, but there's never messages about the downside. And for some people, gambling is a very dangerous activity. It is not a risk-free thing. It is not always fun. It's not always entertainment. That for some people, they can destroy their lives. It got to a point where couldn't pay the mortgage, couldn't pay the credit cards. And whatever made me cross the line, I did something illegal and took some money and my plan was to win it the next day and pay it back. And I got the call that they found out what I was doing and obviously I was gonna be fired and arrested. And at that point, I still kept it from my husband as, much, as long as I possibly could until I had no choice but to tell him what was going on and it all blew up and he left the house. He took my son from me for two weeks. We ended up in a court battle so I could see my son again. Come in August, I got arrested. 401ks went, my pay went every single time I got paid. I'd go to the casino. Also, I became um, an executor to my uncle. He had gone into a nursing home, and unfortunately, I had easy access to his money. And I began using it at the casino. It's been horrible. I've gone through a couple of pieces of property that I owned. I've built up a lot of debt. I've refinanced property that I owned to cover gambling debts. So I decided to start writing myself checks from one of my property management accounts and with the hope that I would win enough to pay back everything that I borrowed. Of course, it did not work that way. As a result, I am now in very deep debt and I've been arrested and am going to jail. We have people that come through our treatment system who have contact with the criminal justice system, who've broken the law, who are facing uh, much heavier, much stiffer sentences than people who have a drug and alcohol problem. The judge is looking at eight years suspended after four years. I received eight years suspended after four years served. I'm now facing an incarceration time beginning Wednesday of 12 years in jail suspended after seven years. What's hard, I think, is that this is about money. And as a society, we want people to repay the victims, but we, we can't expect that the victim's going to be made whole, and it's, it's a hard thing to accept. We have, as a society, decided that drugs and alcohol are something that we can understand as an addiction. 
and that we are not going to punish them when they get into the criminal justice system in the same way that we would punish someone who doesn't have that disease. We haven't made that leap to people with gambling addictions yet. Because oftentimes it's seen as a character flaw or a moral issue rather than a legitimate addiction. It's important to understand that there is a biological chemical reaction in the brain. The brain on gambling reacts the same way as the brain on drugs. When they get the win or the near win, these pleasure centers light up and it's the same pleasure center that lights up when a person ingests a drug. And the research now has changed the definition of addiction. It's no longer something, a substance that you ingest. It's, it's behavior that, you, that was rewarding that you continue to do despite negative consequences and severe reper negative repercussions. You can't do anything. Your brain just craves more and more of the gambling. Excursions became from two or three hours to as much as 10, 12, 14 hours. You're chasing. You're chasing. And you get caught up in it. Gambling is also self-reinforcing. It's what we call intermittent reinforcement. And you may place a bet, and it's not guaranteed that you will win. But if you continue to bet, you most likely will win, but you just don't know when that's going to happen. Research has found that the, the most difficult reinforcement schedule to break is intermittent reinforcement. In fact, the DSM-5, which is the Bible of mental health, took uh, problem gambling out of an unspecified category and put it into addictions along with drug and alcohol. Gambling is easier to hide. You can't smell it, you can't see it. A person may have an underlying gambling disorder and they'll get arrested for larceny or embezzlement, but it goes unrecognized due to a lack of awareness. While in prison, and then even after parole, no one ever guided me to any source or programs for gambling addictions. One of my parole stipulations was uh, no gambling, no casino contact. But actually, when I was on parole, and my parole officer would ask me three questions. Did I move? Did I have police contact? And did I drink? And I'd always add, and can you ask me, did I gamble? And the response from my parole office was, I don't care about that. To this day, that blows me away. No, no one would be released from prison who went there for a drug and alcohol problem without some sort of coordinated plan for what they're going to do and where they need to go and what treatment programs are available for them. Today, people go into prison and come out of prison because of gambling and they're not told anything about what services are available. And in Connecticut, we have fantastic treatment services, which is pretty unusual in the 50 states of the United States. We have the longest consistently funded treatment programs in the nation. And those treatment services are free of charge, and they're called the Better Choice Treatment Programs. And there are multiple programs in different regions throughout the state. Uh, many of the services that are provided are similar to what one would expect in a typical substance abuse mental health treatment setting. Individual therapy, family therapy, financial management support, peer recovery support. We hire peers with life experience, uh, medication management services, and a variety of group counseling options. We know that treatment works, and it's so much less expensive than prison. The average cost of incarcerating someone in Connecticut is over $50,000 a year. The estimates for treatment costs are around $7,500 a year. If all we do is punish these people who come in front of the court, and we don't do anything about treating their gambling addiction, then society's really no better off and we don't have any assurance that there won't be a recidivistic event for them because we're not treating the disease that underlies their behavior. Our hope for integration into the criminal justice system is to you know, first recognize that gambling is an addiction, to encourage people to have the conversation and to know what questions to ask in that conversation. And once it is determined that gambling was a factor in their crime, that appropriate referral for services is made. 
I feel really obviously horrible about what I've done. Life after prison is tough. I'm a felon. There'll never be any jobs for me. I keep beating myself up every day, every hour, because I know I did wrong. It should have never happened, but it did happen. It was a compulsion I just could not control. We understand. I mean, this isn't about being excused from the crime. This is about, we believe in people taking accountability and responsibility for the crime. It's not an excuse. So how do we balance that with the right of a human being to reclaim their life and get back to some semblance of being a productive citizen again, returning to their families, returning to their communities? How do we weigh that when they're standing in the courtroom? Tomorrow, most of you will wake up in your beds at home. Tomorrow, I will begin a well-deserved but dreaded incarceration in a bed surrounded by strangers and away from loved ones. Tomorrow terrifies me as it would anybody being separated from their family and loved ones, but it also begins a painful path to my eventual return to them. It begins my official punishment for my crime, a reckoning. It's been suggested to me by friends that my white-collar crimes aren't so bad. After all, you didn't kill anybody. I did kill, though. I killed my reputation. I killed my prospects for a good job. I killed any pride my parents had when they spoke my name in public. I killed my marriage to a man I love. I killed the trust my employer and colleagues had in me that I earned over three decades. I killed my days of being a mother to my son for some time. While I'm no danger to society, crime demands punishment. I've written a terrible chapter in my life, but I hope to live a life where that chapter is seen as an aberration and one that doesn't define me in a tragic story. Tomorrow I will begin the journey of writing new chapters.